Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Board Game Mechanics. I'm Katie, and with me, as always, is... Hey, guys, what's going on? It is Jason. Oh, it is holiday season's full swing. Oh, I had a birthday this last week, and so several members of the Riveted said happy birthday to me, and so thank you guys so much. And Fickle Favorite Time, someone who has reappeared on the Fickle Favorite list probably more than anyone else... Mike Picorni actually mailed me a gift and it looks awesome. It's a book and I can't wait to read it. So thank you, Mike. You're probably my number one fickle favorite. But again, it's fickle. So someone else might come along and dethrone you. Like if maybe Fred painted, you know, a portrait of me or something. But then Fred might make it weird. So maybe not. (laughs) There's no might. Fred would make it weird. Yeah. Uh, And... Everyone, thanks everyone for validating my no gray hair and that 37 is not old. So thanks for making my birthday special, guys. You guys are awesome all the time. And then you just step it up for birthdays. So thank you. Yeah, you're all right. They're all right. I'm all right. What are you saying? No, the riveted's all right. <laughs> they're, they're pretty okay. I mean, you're better than all right, in my opinion. I would. You, not, not the riveted. <laughs> I would hope so. And Jason um, is recording, having finally had his second root canal in the same tooth, and he has survived. Yeah. It, I, if I have to get another one, I'm just going to have them yank the tooth out. I'm just going to tell them just to give you dentures so I don't have to hear about it anymore. Yeah. I mean, that would be nice, I guess. Then I can just take them <laughs> out at nighttime. Be that old guy with the... The gums that like have his teeth going underneath them. But you're not an old guy is what's weird about it. Yeah. I mean, it's just one tooth. It's not like they have to take them all out. I know. know. But it's been a fiasco. I'm just glad he finally got it done. I almost thought he was going to check it out. (laughs) I'm like, no, we've been dealing with a stinking tooth for like a month because he was supposed to get it taken care of a while ago. Um, But then we got COVID. We got the Rona. So we (laughs) couldn't go anywhere and he couldn't get it fixed. Also, shout out to our friend Tim, who is recovering from COVID. So, hope everybody's staying healthy out there. And if you are sick, rest, take it easy, allow your body to recover. Yes, do all of those things. Okay, let's talk about some fun news. Which, when I was looking through Kickstarter, I thought, man, Kickstarter is... Looking a little rough. Things are slowing down. I didn't see as many things I was interested in, but I grabbed a few. The first one Jason's actually going to talk about because he's got a video on the Kickstarter page. And that is the Suits, and it's the fourth edition, which is Ladies. Right. So I did um, a video of Season 2, which basically Season 1, 2, and 3 are all effectively the same, but they have different characters, which is kind of where this one's laying. Um, This is the fourth installment. But all the other characters were male characters, and this one is ladies. A whole bunch of ladies. Nine ladies, I think. Eight eight or nine ladies. I think five or six ladies. And so I did a video. It's on our YouTube channel. You can go check that out. But what this game is, it's a two-player game where each player is taking on a role of one of the characters. So you pick the character that you like. You're going to have a special ability. And what you're trying to do is you are trying to knock the other player's life down to zero before they knock your life down to zero. You're going to do this by having three cards out in front of you, face down. Your opponent doesn't know what those cards are, but they have to select one to play. They could select something that hurts them. They could select something that hurts you. They could select money that they would then be able to give to you to take some actions. So it's kind of a, you know, what card do you want to take? Am I going to always put the bad card in the same spot? You're going to know that I'm going to do that, that type of ordeal. It's a simple game. It's easy to play. It has really nice art, at least I think it does. And the ladies... Are all pink. I, I mean, you can take that for what it is, but I think they look good. So, the suits, ladies, nine days, twenty-five bucks. It's a cool little two-player game. I like the art. It's just cards, and yeah, if you're into the suits already, this is one you should pick up. Or if not, check this one out. Yeah, it's it's really kind of like a minimalist art style, and I really like the aesthetic of it. I love anything that's really paired with black. 
And so that's like, I don't know. I, maybe that should be my favorite color instead of purple. But I really love the way that, that it looks. It does look really good. Yeah, it's cool because they had orange, blue, and red. So now they have orange, blue, red, and pink, which I think is kind of cool. Also, every time I see this title, it makes me think of the show um, White Collar, where Mozzie always calls um, Tiffany Amber Thiessen's character Lady Suit. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Peter is suit and she's lady suit. Yeah, that's funny. Anyway, so that's the suits. The next one I have is another one that the artwork, honestly, it's what drew me to this on Kickstarter. And it's called Momiji. And if you can't guess by the title, it is a Japanese themed game. I like that. Um, it is beautiful. So Momiji is um, by 3M Games. 3M? That's weird. Yeah. All the designers look French, actually, which I think is interesting. Um, But it's a game about autumn in Japan. And it's this really pretty card game. We are collecting um, leaves and you're playing acorns to help you use different powers to collect these beautiful leaves and make these really pretty landscapes. Um, It looks, I mean, it is the most stinking gorgeous game i mean the artwork is unbelievable so you've got leaf cards and you've got landscape cards which the landscape cards holy moses amazing i i just i i i can't get over like it says it's a poetic card game and i think it's because like there's just some some serious beauty in the way that the game looks so the neat, the other thing I like about this game is it is designed to play solo or competitively, which I think is important. So you've got these objectives that you're trying to fill by collecting like these, the autumn leaves, and different ones are valuable and you're collecting them from the Imperial Garden um, and kind of using your landscape abilities to be able to collect the leaves that you want and um, complete these goals. So I thought, oh, this game is gorgeous. How much is this game? So there's ni- there's 11 days left on this Kickstarter. The base game is only $19, which is just cards, um, 84 cards and some landscape cards and um, some cardboard tokens. So, okay. But so then I'm like, well, well how much is the deluxe? Because you still get the cards. You get the tiles, cardboard tiles for landscapes. You get wooden acorn tokens. And it also comes with an expansion, which has four wooden shaped meeple animals. And so I'm like, well, of course, I got the deluxe edition. I'm like, this is usually where Jason like wants to throw the computer because I always want the deluxe edition because I want shaped meeples. The deluxe edition for Omiji is only $31. I like that. That's nice. Right. So if you like beautiful art, it seems like a lighter weight kind of game. I think Man vs. Meeple actually did a preview on this. Shocking. Probably like five years ago. Um, I didn't watch it because, you know, boring and super boring. I just can't like get into their videos sometimes because I fall asleep. But usually they review like pretty good games. So it seems like this one is a little bit lighter, but it almost reminds me of how with Takedo, it's so beautiful. And even though you are playing the game, it's still very relaxing. I feel like this has the potential to hit that same spot. So that's Momiji. Um, again, there are 11 days left in the Kickstarter. 19 bucks for the base, but only 31 for the deluxe. Yeah, it's not bad. It sounds cool. And I like the price point. So. Did you look at the art? I haven't looked at it yet, but yeah, I, I will. Because usually that's what you do. You look it up while I'm rambling on about it. So you can say, oh, it does look pretty. Yeah, I didn't do that on this one, but sometimes I do do that. Sometimes you do. Okay, the last one is a game with a theme that, I don't know, we own at least two games about the same theme. No. Yeah, just two. And that is Naramata. I think that's how it's called. A game of wine and tourism. And so Naramata, yes, it's set in the Naramata region. I don't know where that is, but apparently they have wines there and wineries. So what you're doing is it's not like you're really running the winery. You're running winery tours. So there are the board is like a map and you are like picking you you have like a car with tourists in it 
and you're going along the trail here. You're trying to match up like what the tourist wants with the different stuff that are on the trail, um, with the, what the different wineries have to offer, like with cheese pairings that could also happen at the winery. Um, it just seems like kind of a fun little, I don't twist on um, the normal kind of why what we I, I feel like what I've come to consider what wine games are like they're usually involved the making of wine at least the ones that we have but um, you're just trying to satisfy tourists over like three days and it has some really neat components in it um, like the turn, the day tracker, cause there's three days, um, is a cork. There are little wooden wine bottles. Um, you've got little vehicles, um, that are wooden that you use to move around, move your tourists around. So you get your vehicle and you're like, okay, we're going to go to this winery and then you're going to put the tourists there. So Time is progressing and moving with the different actions that you're going to do with the tourists. Um, you know, you can buy upgrades to help, you know, satisfy your tourists and the different kinds of things that they want. Um, and by doing that, then you're going to score points at the end of each day. And so you've got a normal game is like three days and a long game is four days and so it's kind of like these roads are laid out and you can see all these different wineries along the route and some of them you know oh maybe maybe your tourists want to buy the wine there maybe they want to have a cheese pairing and you have to see or like a wine tasting and and hook it up for the tourists i just think it seems pretty interesting like it's a very different type of wine game so um Naramata has 12 days left on kickstarter and it's 59 bucks because it is kind of a heftier bit of game. Yeah, I mean, it's going to be a heavy game, a heavier game if it involves winemaking. I don't think you could do like a little like Uno style game that's wine. That would be weird. But you're not making the wine. You're just setting up the winery tours. So it's what happens after you play Vinos and Viticulture? Yes. Although in Viticulture, you do, you can't offer the wine tours, but this is oh, like that's, that's if it was all about that component and you didn't own the winery. Like you don't own the wineries. You just are like the tourism company that specializes in wineries <laughs> and wine winery tours. Yeah, that's funny. Yeah, this game sounds cool. I'm, I'm going to check this one out too. Yeah, I just thought it was a different little thing. So... After searching through the kind of the trash heap that <laughs> um, Kickstarter is right now, that is what I found for news. All right. So now let's talk about some games that we played. So we actually got some games played, which is cool. We did. Quite a few. We, yeah. Because we like to play games and it was a little dry spell there for a while. So I think we're out of that. We're moving on. Moving forward into 2021 on a high note. Um, so we're going to talk about three. And the first game we're going to talk about is a game that we purchased on a deal. We were at a game store looking around and it looked cool. And Katie said, hey, we need to get this because it's Japanese theme. And I obliged. And it was on like 30% discount. So that always helps. Yeah, I was going to say, to be fair, any game that we actually buy is going to be on discount or Jason won't buy it. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Um, so this game is called Hagakure, or something like that. Um, it's from Studio H. It's a trick-taking game. I have a video of it on YouTube if you want to go check that out. And this is a two-suit trick-taking game that can play three to five players. Um, you're trying to score the most points over a certain number of rounds, depending on the number of players. And the, the cool thing that I like about this is there's a little action... So like a little uh, bonus action that you can select before you take your turn. There's five different types of special abilities. And before you just, before you start playing cards in a trick, you can decide if you want to play one of those special abilities, you know, to try to get some points, and get, you know, not lose points, what, so on and so forth. And then you're going to play the round. So it's normal trick taking, but you don't always have to follow suit. So if someone plays a samurai, which is the red suit, you have to follow suit. But if someone plays a villager, which is the blue suit, you can play whatever you want, which kind of gives you a little more... Uh, you know, decision space, so to speak, in this game. So what did you think of Hagakure? I liked it, but what did you think about it? I liked it too, um, because in general, I do like trick-taking games. And also the artwork is really cute and, and lovely in that Japanese style. It's very, like, minimalist, but still really good. Um, and I like that 
there there are there's some push your luck to it because you're going to use your special powers before you really see how the round's going to go um and you always want to get you have to get one trick each round um so if you think ah, I'm not going to get any, you could say, okay, I'm going to take zero for this round. But if you end up taking one, then you're like, oh, I don't get any points for that. So it's like short and simple, but there still are some decisions to be made. And like, I think I need to play it more because I'm so used to playing like Euchre as a trick taking game where I'm really familiar with all the suits and the general way that people play Euchre and how things tend to flow out when certain cards are played and what pulls and what doesn't and having that like little mechanic where you have to follow suit if it's a samurai but if it's a villager you don't so then you're like I don't really know what people are going to play if I put this out there Um, and there are several different ways to gain points and to try and boost the points that you get which I think is really fun and like how you decide what you're going to go after I, I really enjoyed it i I'm looking forward to playing this one again. Yeah, I like it. And the, another cool thing is if they're, you're playing with less than five players, you're going to take some of the cards out. So that's going to make it, you know, you're not going to have all the cards in there to make it a little more puzzly and all that. So that's pretty cool. Yeah, like in Euchre with the kitty. Right, yep. Uh, so the next game we played, we actually got to play twice. Uh, I'm not sure if we talked about it last week or not. So if we did, just pretend like we did it. We did. And the game is called Tattoo Brawl. This is another game that we bought. Yeah, what's that, people? This is a Kickstarter that I backed. I was I like, do not back just bought, that you actually backed the Kickstarter. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I want everybody who's listening to this know that I do back some Kickstarters. Not the deluxe versions, mind you. Boo. But I, but I did back it. So um, Tattoo Brawl is a game from Gaming Hole. I don't know how many games they've done. I think this might be their first game or second. And this is a game where you are a tattoo artist and you're trying to attract clients to your studio to give them the tattoos that they want. But you really want to get clients that get the tattoo of your specialty. So maybe neo-traditional, watercolor, tribal, lettering, so on and so forth. There's seven different kinds. And you're trying to be the first person to um, complete four tattoos. That'll trigger the end of the game. Then you're going to score points for the types of tattoos you did, whoever did the most in each category, and having some good tattoo ink left over. So it's kind of an action selection um set collection a little bit because you're trying to get some ink contract fulfillment really yeah contract fulfillment a little bit of take that because you can steal stuff from your other people like clients and paint and stuff or our ink i guess is not paint i keep thinking it's paint but yeah so tattoo brawl i dig this one i like the color pattern it's a lot of white with um stark contrast of like yellows blues and reds and i think that looks cool so what do you think of tattoo brawl also i have a video on youtube of this if you want to check it out um, I really love the theme. Like, I think that that's so cool. And every time I play it, I'm like, oh, man, I need another tattoo so bad. Like, I keep thinking that <laughs> all the times, a couple times we played it. Um, but I can see the more that we play it, the more I might have problems with it. Because when there's a, a fairly limited deck of customers and you do need to cycle through them because you're wanting to find customers that either... Um, want tattoos on an area of the body that you are proficient at, which means you can tattoo it in less time, or that they want your particular style of tattoo, which means you get more money for it and um, you can use less ink to do it because you're just better at it. Um, I can, part of that is when they're laid out on the table to draw from, you can only see the body part that they want tattooed. Now, we've played it twice, and while there's a okay number of clients I'm starting to know which clients want what style without having to choose the client and turn it over um just because I don't think yeah that, that, that's true I don't think there's enough cards there um I, I don't know I like it I, I I like it um but I already am thinking that I want an expansion for it to give me more clients, to give me more tattoos, or I don't, maybe I just haven't figured out how to do it well because I find it very difficult to get more, you know, the four tattoos done. Or I just, I'm not getting enough tattoos done. I'm not sure. Maybe I'm waiting for, like, I just think there are maybe a few, also a few rule bugs and things that I'd like to make 
to iron out to make it a smoother game. But I think the fact that I want those and I want more cards shows that it is really a good game. And aesthetically, I love it the way the cards fit in. Like you get whoever your tattoo artist is for your player. They have a player power, which I think is awesome. And then um, you put them into your player board and it looks like your tattoo artist is sitting down next to a tattoo chair and then you take a customer and you flip them over you put them in the chair it's like everything fits together it looks really cool and you can just lay the tattoo that you're gonna do right on top of that all those spaces like I think design looks good um there's a lot of great points about it yeah I agree I I like this game a lot I do agree with you that it needs an expansion because having only what like 21 different clients that you can tattoo I don't know. And there's not that many tattoos either. So I think there just needs to be some more variability. Maybe like another part of the game that you can do to focus, have other actions that you can do while you're tattooing. Because you're kind of limited once you start a tattoo of what you can do. Yeah. And I don't love that part. But I still like the game. It's fun. I just don't know how often I'm going to want to keep playing it over and over and over. Yeah. Agreed. But still, it's it's really good. And honestly, we have so many games that it will in the like if we will probably we've played it a couple times we'll probably put it away since we played it with a lot of our regulars and we won't touch it you know for several months and so then we take it back out again it'll probably feel fresh and new and great then anyway so yeah that's true that's true still good good definitely worth it all right and the last game we're going to talk about is a game from Reiner Knizia which what? we never talk about his games cuz i don't love his games i think and- we own like Two. And I don't know any of his games, so you know. right. <laughs> one of Ka- one of Katie's favorite Reiner Knizia games is called Hollywood Blockbuster. Oh my gosh, that game sucks so bad. <laughs> She's wrong, I hate but that's that. one we own, and we also have Lost Cities. We don't have a ton, but the game have we I played, played Lost Cities. No, I don't think you have. I think I played it with Brandon oh, only. Okay, but the game we played is Blue Moon City, the Simon version. So that's a reprint of the original from somebody. Don't know, but we played the Simon version. So watch out, and, Simon and Reiner Knizia. Yeah, watch out. That's a double double boomer. <laughs> All we needed is like Cthulhu and f- <laughs> mini- minis, and we'd be set. Well, there were dragon minis. There were oh, my three gosh. dragon minis. Yep. We lost our minds. All right. So what you're doing in this game is this is effectively it's a set collection game, sort of, and you're using these different colored cards to fulfill the needs of these tiles that are making up a five by five grid. Once all the spaces on these tiles have been completed, so say there's three three spaces that people can contribute to, which means play cards of the matching colors and the certain values. Once all those are, are done, whoever has the majority of tokens there or as farthest left is going to get a bonus. Everybody else who's contributed is going to get um, the uh, a contribution bonus. Then the tile is going to flip. And then if you do that to a tile that's next to a tile that's flipped, you're going to get what's on the tile and all the adjacent flip tiles bonus. And then if there's a dragon there, you're going to get some dragon scales. The ultimate end goal of the game is to collect as many gems as you can to help rebuild the obelisk. And the first person to contribute to four sections of the obelisk is the winner. So it's kind of a race game to collect gems and then spend gems as fast as you can with some cool card play and moving around the board. So what did you think about Blue Moon City? Um, I really liked it, it with one exception, and that is that it's a race. Um, what I would have done if I had been Ryder Canicia, are you listening to this? I'm sure he's not. Um, <laughs> the guy's only designed like five or 600 games. Well, here's, there's a flaw in this one, because what he should have done was had the game end when the obelisk was filled with contributions and then you total up your contributions and whoever has the most contributions win because I I just don't like that racing race mechanic. Um, However, I really like everything else about this game. Um, I, I thought it was really fun. I, I liked that the cards have different powers. And so again, they're multi-use cards. So I'm going to use it for a special power if it has one, which most of them do. Or am I going to use it to um, go in and and fulfill um, whatever the different space is looking for for the different contracts, um, which I 
think it's really great. Like, I, I like that. The color scheme is bad. Bad, bad, bad. That's what sucks. It's ugly. It's ugly as sin. Yeah, and some of the cards, like, look alike, which is rough, too. Yes. I don't know why they couldn't get more distinctive on the colors. However, that aside, like, I thought it was really fun. And I was actually kind of disappointed when I felt like it was off so fast. Like, it was done too quick for me. Because I'm like, oh, you know, this was great. I'd like to play some more. So, yeah, I, I enjoyed it. I was surprised. Yeah. yeah, I agree with you. I think this is one that I would play again because I had fun. It's just one of those things. It's not a hard game to play. No. Um, you're just collecting sets of cards. You can also play cards for the ability that's on, on the card instead of using it to fulfill one of those little contracts. But it, it's just moving around, playing cards, trying to be the first person to contribute to the obelisk four times. Super easy to play, but fun. You're not really getting in anybody's face. You're kind of all working together to fulfill these tiles because everybody's going to get something. So there's no no meanness, really. So I, I like that. So, yeah, I like this one. I would definitely play it again. Yeah, that's good. All right, well, that was the games we played. Let's get into the feature and continue the top 100 games of all time. <laughs> Why? Why are you got to make it weird? Why not? It's not a secret. We're actually telling people. <laughs> so we are, we've reached the top 30. We are tonight, today, whenever you're listening to this podcast, we are going to cover games 30 through 21. I have a feeling that as we go up from here, there will be... A lot more repeating games. Um, I don't think we have quite that many in this section. But again, some of the ones that you see tonight from one of us, you'll probably see from the other one next week and vice versa. Um, Just because we tend to like a certain type of game and you all are very aware of that. Um, So we'll try not to belabor those points, but you'll quickly see kind of games are our favorites so jason start us off with your number 30 babe so that type of game that we love is called ameritrash <laughs> and and the first one i want to talk about is number 30 and it's a super ameritrashy game there's elder gods and there's miniatures <laughs> and there's fighting and area control and everything yeah and it's called hadara there's so much of that in there <laughs> oh wait <laughs> Yeah, so I think you talked about Hadara either last week or the week before, but I remember discussing it. I remember discussing and it because I couldn't remember any of the specifics of it other than you were picking cards <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> with different colors. So, so this is effectively a drafting game, but the way you draft is everyone's drafting. There's five different colors, and everyone on every turn is going to be drafting from one of the different colors. So you're not going to be competing directly each turn. You're going to just have to wait your turn to you get to that color. Then you're going to use those colors to build up your own civilization, to try to increase your military, your culture. Um, you're trying to get green cards to feed your people. It's everything that Seven Wonders wanted to be, and it plays easier. It's about the same amount of time, but it's way easier to teach than Seven Wonders, and I think it's about a thousand times more fun. So my number 30, Hadara. I think when I talked about this, you said it's like what Seven Seven Wonders wants to be. And I was like, what? But now that you said it this time, I'm like, oh, I see that. And I agree. I mean, I probably did. I, I, I've i been known to reuse a couple <laughs> jokes here and there. Yeah. Oh, I'm just a couple. Okay. <laughs> um, my number 30 is a game, probably one of our most played games, not within this past year, but definitely in 2019, I would say. And... Uh, we haven't played it for a while, but it's still so good. And that is Dice Forge. I don't know if we've talked about it prior to now. I'm maybe. Um, but Dice Forge is a game where you are specially making dice, like by changing the sides. And you change those sides um, by getting coins and or different types of gems to purchase sides that are better than the sides you start with. Um, Or you can use them to purchase cards that will give you points and or abilities. Um, The the great thing about Dice Forge is that on on every turn, even if it's not yours, you are doing something. Every turn, everybody rolls their dice, gets something. Then the person who turns is takes the extra action. Next turn, again, everybody rolls again. So um, you're you're generating lots of stuff. 
And then when it comes to your turn, you can cash that stuff in. So it's a really easy mechanic to teach to people. And especially newer gamers like that because they're always constantly involved. But the reason that I love this game, obviously, is multiple paths to victory. Because you can go for the big point cards. Um, I like to convert money through like forging hammers and then getting um, sides that turn to victory points or, you know, there are just so many different ways to do this. And um, it's just fun that chuck and dice is, is cool. And the artwork is really neat. It's really pretty. You play out of the box um, with, or all the little dice sides go. Um, and then like the board lays out from that for all your cards. So the look is really pleasant. And I think it's just a really attractive game that's easy to get people to play. So my number 30 is Dice Forge. Yeah, we played this a ton. Not this, yeah, in 2019. It was our most played game in 2019 for sure. All right, so my number 29 is a game from the Italians. And it is called Newton. I don't know why I said it like that. I don't Newton. Either. But it's so yeah. low. I can't believe it's so low on your list. I know. I'm ashamed have, of I you. Have, I have so many good games, okay? We got to make room. Whatever. So Newton is effectively a whole bunch of mechanisms all thrown together. Um, it has deck building. It has um, s- moving dudes around on a map to try to just get cubes in a you know a network. You're trying to cover up spaces on your board by doing some set collection of certain color books. It's just a great Euro game. Uh, there's so much going on that it's hard to explain. But once you kind of understand how the game plays, and if you're familiar with any of the other designs by the Italians, it'll feel familiar. So it's not my favorite game by them by any stretch of the imagination, but I do like it, and it's super fun, and that's my number 29, Newton. Newton. (laughs) Newton. I don't know why I'm saying it like like a tool bag today. Newton. Newton. Um, Newton. I like Newton a lot, and we will be talking about that later in its appropriate spot. My number 29 um, is a game that I love based on probably the most ridiculous reasons possible because I like to look at all the tiles. And that is Castles of Mad King Ludwig. Um, I, I, I like design stuff. I tend to play like I like video games and even growing up like old school computer games and stuff where you could design like houses and rooms and stuff like that like. I am by no means good at that in real life because you need to have some kind of precision involved in that. But I like looking at um, how different things flow together and color and um, just composition. And so for me, that's what Castle of Madeline Ludwig does is I see all these cool rooms. I'm like, ooh, you know, okay, if I'm going to have the nap room here, wouldn't it be nice to have a pantry next door? Because if you want a little, like, snack, you know, before you went and took a nap, like, I'm building all these scenarios in my head that are not all required in the game. <laughs> because in the game, you are drafting and, and paying for different types of rooms each round in, like, an, I guess, I don't, it's not really auction style, but sort of. Sort of, yeah, yeah, sort of. Um, because you are trying to build your own castle that are going to fulfill your own private goals for points as well as fulfill the goals that the Mad King decides he wants in his castle. I get caught up in reading all the different tiles and making up my own little, like, story scenarios of what is happening in a castle that looks the way mine does. Most of it involves having an extensive dungeon area um, just because that just seems like what you would have to have in a castle is a bottomless pit and a fungus room and, you know, um, a Venus grotto that leads to a secret lair because of course, um, <laughs> I don't know. I just really love this game. I think it's fun. Other people, I think that have like a whimsical kind of, feel about games and like to create theme because it really looks a lot of gray actually um but i i've played with several other people that enjoy it in that way like oh look at this room oh this room's cool and that's kind of how you play it now do i win very often absolutely not because i'm so caught up in the different rooms but it is like a really neat kind of drafting game um where you're trying to hit your certain goals you can 
gain more goals as you go along, which I think is really great. And there are just certain restrictions for how different rooms can be laid. And you're also trying to find that really that sweet spot between placing a room that you need for a goal, but also gaining points from the room's placement itself. And I think there's a lot of fun in this. And this game is even better now because an amazing member of the Riveted printed me um, an organization like insert. So I just have to pull that out and, and set it out and it's done and it's awesome. So my number 29 is Castles of Mad King Ludwig. Yeah, this is a good one. I like it. And the more we just played it not that long ago and I really did like it. So Ha-ha. yeah, this is good. All right. So my number 28 is a game that we've played a lot. We've gotten it this year from a Kickstarter for a review and we played it a lot. And that game is called Downton Abbey meets Jane Austen the board game or Obsession. Wait, are you sure you're not reading mine? My number 28 is Obsession. I'm positive I'm not reading yours. It just happened to turn out that way because we are professionals. We have the same obsession and it's number 28 Obsession. (laughs) Yeah, so I'll I'll talk about it a little bit and then you can chime in if you want. Sure. Um, So Obsession is, I don't even know how to explain it. It's a... An action selection game, but you also have to have certain different colored meeples to activate the room. Yeah, you have to have certain different colored servants, which are meeples to activate the room. And then you got to have certain cards in your hand to be able to play to go along with the room. Okay, wait, stop. If you explain it with the theme, it makes a lot more sense. All right. So my number 28 is Obsession, and I'll let Katie tell you why it's awesome. (laughs) How about that? So... The crux of the game is that you're like a down and out family. You used to be prestigious and wealthy. Now you are neither. Um, But you want to get back to that. So you're going to try to impress these newly moved to the neighborhood young couple, a brother and sister, um, who have lots of money. And you want to impress them so that they will help you become more prestigious and wealthy. So you're going to do that by hosting events at your estate and getting more and more prestigious people to come to them to make you more prestigious and to bring you more money. So every turn, every each one of your turns, it's I'm going to host an event. I'm going to invite people to come to it. I'm going to employ servants to run it. I'm going to collect the benefits from it. Then you can also, you're, you're constantly trying to expand your estate so that you can um, have different, more types of activities. And all the while, those benefits are trying to get more prestigious guests, become more prestigious yourself, get more money, and win the favor of this um, brother and sister that are new to the neighborhood. The Fairchilds. The Fairchilds. Yep. That sounds exactly like what I was saying. You grab a tile, you grab some meeples, you grab some cards, and you play them. (laughs) That's exactly what I was saying. Same, same. (laughs) <laughs> so yeah r28 collectively is obsession it's so good everybody i mean and when i talked I, I was thinking about this when we were talking about tattoo brawl in the games played about how gosh the more i play i'm just memorizing stuff and it's not as fun that is not true for obsession oh no there are so many guests you never get through. There's so many tiles. We have the upstairs downstairs expansion, which adds so many really great choices. I mean, you need to check out our review of it, our video of it on YouTube, um, because the designer even said how awesome I did on it. <laughs> Not the two dollar horn. <laughs> but- I'm amazing. But the designer loves me and what I have to say about this game, and you should check it out. But no, it's a great game. So we'll just move on to number 27. (laughs) Yeah. So, yeah. Our 27s are not the same. We'll just get that out of the way. No, but you will see my 20, your 27 again later. (laughs) That's true. So my number 27 is a space game. That's right. Space. What? No minis. Barely has production at all. But it's called Terraforming Mars. And for some reason, we held off on playing this, mostly because it looks awful. Yes. And it's in space. Yes. But the gameplay is amazing. So this is nothing but a huge engine building game. Um, You're playing cards down in front of you to grow your engine to kind of have different powers fire off at different times. And you're trying to increase the oxygen, the heat, and put some water on Mars. It's kind kind of a race game, sort of, because whenever you 
put out all the water, the oxygen, and raise the heat enough, the game is over. So you're trying to make sure that you have more points than your opponent before all that stuff happens. Really cool game. The way the cards work together is really fantastic. If you're playing with the different corporations that give you a different player power than the other players, that's the way to go. So my number 27, Terraforming Mars. Yeah, I like it. Um, Maybe more than Jason. Yeah, maybe. We'll see. So my number 27 is a theme that I actually like with art that I really like. And that is Elysium. And this is from Space Cowboy. Cowboys. Hey. Yep, that, that's correct. I knew that. that. Correct. Good job. I don't remember who the designer is. Dang it. Oh, I should know this. I think it's um, Matthew Dunstan, I think. Okay, I don't know. I just <laughs> Space Cowboys <laughs> made it. Um, I, maybe, we, maybe we should stop while we're ahead. Yeah, I got one part right that never happens. It's because I really, really like this game. It's so good. So this is uh, another drafting game, again, that um, pushes um, Seven Wonders to the ground and kicks it in the side many times before spitting on it because it is so good. You're not only drafting, but then you can develop this engine of um, getting cards that have powers that help you get more cards that help you um, get point cards that you can then kind of um, move into Elysium, which is like your holding place for the end of the game where you're creating sets to give you points along with some like long term possible cards that you might have. Um I heard tell that they're, they were talking about expansion for this, which would blow my mind. But why there hasn't been, I don't know. Because basically you would just add more gods to the Pantheon because you're playing with, um, I think this is Roman. No, it's Greek. No, it's like Zeus and Athena. Yeah, so it's Greek. Um, Greek gods and goddesses, which is one of my favorite um, areas of interest. I really love mythology. So, I mean... You could expand on the Pantheon in Greece even, or you could do other Pantheon gods and make like a whole nother. Th- I mean, just the, the game itself is so good. And so that's why number 27 is Elysium. Yeah, this is a good game. And my only issue with it is, is there's only seven god cards. Yeah. And, you know, you can have so much more and so much more variety and because the, the gameplay is there. You just be nice to have different cards. You don't play yeah, with all good... of them every time, which is what helps. But still. Yeah, you play with four, I think. But still, that, that only leaves three. It'd be nice to have like 10 or 12. Yeah. That would give you a little more variety. Well, there's 12 seats in Olympus. They could have at least done that. Come on. Yeah. Give me an expansion. <laughs> we could have done president of the United States. and We could have had, what, 46? Why? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I'm just trying to spitball here. Um, stupid spitball going on to 26 is a great game about making coats and jackets and dresses. And you put it too low again. I did. I did. You're probably right. And it, but it's called Rococo and this is, um, a worker or not worker placement, a a deck building game of sorts Mm -hmm. where you're hiring and firing workers to help you make dresses, get cloth, get like silk and thread and all that stuff. And then you're trying to either to, to, Make dresses to put them on display in the ball or sell them for money because you're going to need money to fund some musicians, to sponsor some statues, put on some fireworks displays. So it's just a, you know, a good back and forth of, you know, do I want to put my dress on display to try to get area majority or do I need money now? So I'll sacrifice it to have some cash to play further. Really good game. Um, I don't know. We don't play it as much as we did in the past and I don't know why because it's good, but. 26, Rococo, probably because we have so many games. That's probably probably it. Yeah, this game is good. Um, Eagle Griffin, again, just did an, a new version of it, which, you know, as, as much as Jason gets bitter about how much Eagle Griffin costs and all of that stuff, it's gotten people to actually freaking play this game, which That's is true. about that time. Is true. Because I was tired of hearing people be like, oh, no, I don't want to play Rococo because it's about making dresses. And so when I see Hottie James Hudson pulling it out and playing it on the board game groups on Facebook. I'm like, thank you. Thank you. Yes, you're getting ready to make some dresses, James. And they're going to be awesome because this game is awesome. Jason is fake news because he put it all the way down here at 26, but we will see it again in its proper place later. Well, it's not just making dresses. It's making coats and jackets, too. Uh, So, I mean, it's not 
it's not like Preda Porter where you're just strictly doing fashion, which I guess is a bigger turnoff of a theme. Because this one's just making coats and jackets. You're just a, you know, a seamster. Taylor. Taylor. <laughs> a tailor. Yeah, that's right. That's the word. That's the word. You're right. Yeah. But there is like really fine, I think, mechanics that you're you're working out in here about managing the the employees in your hand, deciding, am I going to take the cash for the stress or am I going to put it on display to do an area control bit? Um, like there, there's just some, some really good decisions and stuff that go into this game that make it like, I constantly find it myself like beating my brain every time we play this, like, how can I do this right? How can I, I do better at this game? Because there is a lot going on here. It's so good. Yep. It's good. My number 26 is a game that we didn't have for a long time and I thought I would hate. And the first time we played it, I was like, eh. um, but the second and the third and the fourth, I really like this game. My number 26 is Tapestry. You know why you liked it? Because on the second, third, and fourth time, you stole my military strategy because you're a jerk. Um, I d- didn't do that on purpose. The first time I was all science all the way. I, I did not think I stole your military strategy. I just played better and I won handily. All right. Yeah. We're so, done talking about this. So Tapestry is, they say, like, I guess it's building a civilization, but not it's not civ building. If that makes sense. R- yeah. I mean, it's civilization. And it's theme track only. moving. <laughs> right, so yeah. you're moving and managing tracks and it does have minis in it and they're little cute buildings that I like to play with because that's what I do. Um, but you're just kind of pursuing the, the different tracks of what a civilization is like and, um, you know, getting technology and you're doing some exploration and, you know, farming and all different kinds of things. And the more I play it, the more the first time I was like, what the heck is going on here? And it took me pretty much all the game to figure out what what the crap I was doing. But once I did the next time, it was like, oh, my gosh, so much better. So if you've played this game once or if you haven't played it all, I would say play it twice before you judge it. Um, Because after like by that second play, I was like, I totally know what's going on here. And again, I like it so much because multiple paths to victory. You can go science. You can go military. You can, you know, try to build up your technologies. You can be getting all the buildings that you can. Um, You can be piggybacking off people. Like it's, you can be trying to get really high powered tapestry cards or get several so you can choose from. Um, I, I love that. I love that. I and I I just think that that's really interesting and there's a lot of really interesting things kind of rolled up into this game. Um we have the expansion which has um Empire what is it called? Plans and Ploys. Okay. I have no idea what it's called. Plans and Ploys which you can do some different stuff in that I'm kind of excited to explore. Um but even without that expansion, that's my number 26. That's Tapestry. Yeah, Tapestry's good. Um I'm moving on to my number 25. Because I may talk about Tapestry later. So my number 25 is a game about making wine. Because we have a couple. And of course one of them is going to show up in this list. Maybe both. <laughs> and that game is called Vinos. So this this is a Vitale Lacerda game. Um, we have the old and busted What's Your Game version. Not the swank looking Eagle Griffin version. Because they're expensive. They play the same. What you're doing in this is you are trying to produce wine from your vineyards, hire people to help you produce better wine, um, then send that wine off to either the local hotel to sell it for money, send it off to the foreign market to score points somehow. I don't know how that works in real life, but I don't really care. And then uh, you can also go to the bank to take out money if you need some cash to you know buy more vineyards and stuff. And then finally, you're going to take the wine that you produced in the year, because there's two or three rounds per year, and at the end of each year, you're going to have a wine fair, and you're going to enter your best wine with some of your best specialists to try to score the most points, because making wine is all about points, I guess. This is a really good game. It's super hard to teach, and I I still don't know if I'm good at teaching it. I've taught it to about, I've played it about four or five times, and I've taught it all but once, and I... I think I do okay, but it's just, it's got a lot of little fiddly rules, and that wine fair is a beast to teach, and I hate it. But if you can get through that and you can learn it, 
it's enjoyable. So my number 25, Vinos. Yeah. Um, the first time I played it, Jason didn't teach it. I hated it, hated it, hated it. We tried it again. I put him through the ringer of teaching me. I'm like, well, I don't get it. What am I doing with this? What is wrong with this? Like, why would I do that? Um, I was really obnoxious about it. But it really did make – I really – the second time, once I felt like I was – I really – dug into all the rules and forced all like I had to get my mind wrapped around all the explanation of how to do things. Um, I liked it so much better. And I, I do really enjoy this game. It's definitely not this high for me, maybe another playthrough or two, but I don't know. It's a little bit even too dry for me. No pun intended. Um, and, but it's, it's definitely not my favorite Vital Asserta game, but it still is good. It's good. Yep. My number 25, we just recently played and therefore talked about it. And that is Orléans. And actually there was a great sale over Black Friday for this. And I know several people have picked in the Riveted have picked this up and as they should have, right. Because it was a killer deal. Because obviously it's number 25. It is good. It is good. This game is good. Um, Orléans is a bag drawing game, a bag building game. So you are pulling workers out of a bag. They all have different functions. You're placing them on your board um, to do different actions or to help gain other workers that will then do other actions. Um, there's also one of the actions you can do has to do with a map and you're moving around um, and setting up settlements in different places. We also like to play with the expansion, the commerce expansion, trade expansion, trade. Trade, yeah. trade, trade expansion, um, where you can do some contract fulfillment as well for points. Um, it It's hideous. It's so ugly. It's so yellowy orange in color. Um, but it kind of does lend to like a medieval look. It reminds me of um, those old tapestries that you would see in medieval castles and its artistry but it is a really really good fun game lots of variety lots of pass the victory again that's why i like it number 25 is orleans yeah it definitely makes london first edition look good that's for sure <laughs> it, it's just a different color than london first edition <laughs> <laughs> that's true all right so my number 24 is also a game that i think looks pretty boring but it has some cool color player pieces, and it has a giant obelisk on the board. And that game is called Tekenhu Obelisk of the Sun. Is this high? Are you yeah, nuts? I, really, I like it. It's good. So this is a game. It's a dice drafting game where you're going to be drafting dice from around different sections of the obelisk, which are going to reference one of, I think, six Egyptian gods. Or no, not Egyptian. Um, yes, Egyptian. Yeah, okay, it is Egyptian, yeah. And then you're going to be either taking an action for that god based on the value of the die that you take, or you're going to use the die to get resources because you're going to need resources to spend to do some of the other actions. It's just um, there's a way way more to it than that, but at its core, that's kind of what it is. And I like all the options that you can have when you take a single die, and I just I just think that it's the way dice drafting should be done in a heavy game, and it doesn't bog you down with a ton of rules. So my number 24 is Takinu. Obelisk of the Sun. I don't know if I ranked this game for this. Um, maybe. I. It's a good game. It should not be number 24, but it is good. It should not be higher than Newton, but it, it's a good game. It's heavy, and it's dice drafting, which are all great things. It's got some fiddly stuff that I don't think needs to belong in there, which is why I don't love it as well as some other things. Um, but I would like to give it more plays. I think it deserves Deserves being the top 100 for sure. My number 24 um, may have been mentioned before, and that's Terraforming Mars. I actually like it better than Jason. Um, and that's because you win it way more than me. <laughs> I do. Um, because I really like to use that card play to like develop some really great engines to get like recurring point abilities and things like that. Like, I just that's where it's at, man, for me. I love that. Um, it is hideous. I don't understand why they made it so ugly. The cards are ugly and like so thin. And the is the board paper or is it actually cardboard? It's because Stronghold Games is always trying to make a buck. That's why. Well, I would actually. I'm if if Eagle Griffin decided they would make Terraforming Mars, 
or if anybody, if someone made a chibi version of Terraforming Mars, I would shell out bucks for that. To get it to look cuter, to get it to look even just nicer in general. Like it's just hideous and and really kind of crappy in construction. But the game is really it's just so fun. Actually, I'd love it if someone took the theme off entirely, made it a new game, exact same mechanics, but just made it like farming. <laughs> like I will go back to the tried and true um, kind of themes. I, there are, I think, hundreds of themes you could put on this that would make it really cool and look way better and then be more accessible to everyone. Because I honestly did not play this because it said Mars. I hate space. And I looked at it and it's hideous. But ooh, it, it's number 24, man. Number 24, the gameplay is number 24. Yeah, there's nothing about this game when you see it on the table that thinks, man, I need to play this game. <laughs> nothing. Yeah. I, it's bad. Uh, I mean. But if you can get past that, it's really good. Yeah, this is like, this reminds me like of the, there was this old reality TV show that Aston, Kuch, Aston Kutcher was the like maid, and it's called Beauty and the Geek. And so like they'd have these geeks and like halfway through the season, they would put them through like a makeover and they would be like really hot, but they'd already been really nice, cool guys up till then. That's kind of what Terraforming Mars is. Like it's really cool deep down, but its appearance is a big turnoff. And I want someone, I, I need like the Fab Five to come to a makeover Terraforming Mars to give it the look it deserves. That's my analogy for Terraforming Mars, my number 24. Yeah, I don't even know what to say to that. So I'm just going to move to my number 23. So my number 23 is the complete opposite of Terraforming Mars. It looks good. It has nice bits, great production. Like, it makes Terraforming Mars look like a bigger turd than it already looks. And that <laughs> is Goo Gong is my 23. Uh, Goo Gong is a worker placement game, but instead of using, like, workers, you're using a really cool card mechanic where... You have to play a card that's lower than the one that's already out there or higher. Either way, you have to either be higher or lower than the card that's already out there. And then the card that you take is going to be the card that you're going to use the next round. So you're always planning on where you want to go to take the action that you can take to try to get cards that you can use for the next round. Cool game. You're doing some shipping. You're trying to collect some jade. You're contributing to the Great Wall. You're moving a horse around a map to gather stuff. And it's a, you know, a Euro game. But the cool thing about this one is you also have an emperor, a little meeper, meeple that you're trying to climb up the stairs to get to the emperor. And if you can't get to the top of the stairs, you can't win the game. So you're always focused on that as well because no matter what happens in the game, you got to be at the top of those steps or you have no chance of winning. So, And that's cool to me. So my number 23, Goo Gong. Yeah, I talked about this either last week or the week before or something. This game is good and it would not be ranked as high um, if it were at two players, but three players and above, yes, this game is so good. Yeah, two players looks like Terraforming Mars. <laughs> no, two pl two players plays like Terraforming Mars looks. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. My number 23 is also a hideous game. Um, at least the box art is woof. Yeah, I don't think the game looks that bad. No, but the box art's bad. And I don't know why no one's just given it a new, like, just reboxed it. Like, it wouldn't be that hard. Um, my number no 23. No one cares. Minor 23 is Concordia. And honestly, because the box was ugly and weird looking, I didn't play it for a long time because I'm like, eh, I don't know about that. But it's a, it's such a fun game. You are kind of moving around almost an area control type where you are putting settlements in these different cities um, around the Mediterranean. And then you're using those to get resources that you can trade for. Um, it's got this really unique um kind of like i i guess it's deck building um what do you call that card selection like, like like hand building almost because you never really shuffle you always have your cards available once you pick them up right. yeah i don't know what it's called actually I, I there's a name for that that is escaping my brain right now um but you have these cards that have rolls on them that that's how you select what you're gonna do is cards um, and so you're going to play a card and whatever that card is, it's the action that you can take. And you may have more than one of those cards in your hand. You may not. 
Um, and at some point, you're going to run out of those cards in your hand and have to pick those cards up again. And when you do that, it's strategic. Um, where you're placing settlements is strategic, trying to get one in every different area on the map, all these different regions. Um, money is super tight in this game. We also have the salt expansion. Um, it has a name. Salsa. Salsa. Um, which is cool. It gives you like a, a, a wild um, resource, but the bags of salt are like like someone made the expansion and they had forgotten what size the initial components were and they made it like five times the size of the other things. But it's, it's still really fun. Maybe it's to show the inherent value of salt. I don't know. Um, but it's just a really good game. And everyone I've taught, I've only had one Actually, the first time I played this was not the best experience. I played with people that, um, while very nice, um, one guy was not good at games, period. And the other people I played with just had a lot of AP. So I, I think I played this, the first time I played this game, it took hours. And it, it there's really no reason for it to take that long. Um, but it, I still wanted to come back to it. That's how good it was. Um, which is why it's my number 23. So Concordia. Yeah, that is a good game. And yeah, it looks hideous. But I think usually when I see something that looks hideous, I'm more intrigued. Of course. Um, that makes me so worry I'm, about myself. <laughs> no, in games, not in, like in, in life. Uh, my, my number 22 is a game that actually doesn't look hideous. So I don't know why I like this thing. <laughs> um, but it's another winemaking game. Everybody should know what that is. It's Viticulture. Um, Stonemeyer, man, they're really hitting this list today. They are. Um, so Viticulture is a simpler version. Well, it's not even the same thing as Vinos, but it's a, a lighter winemaking game where you are, it's a worker placement game. You're going around trying to collect different, um, vineyards to start growing some wine in. You're going around to try to get different. You're going to grow the grapes. You can't grow wine. Yeah, that's right. You're growing grapes. Yeah. You can't just grow wine. That would be a whole different type of game. Yeah. Um, you're trying to get specialists that are going to help you make the wine. You're trying to build different types of buildings that will make your sellers expand, make you be able to give tours to people. Uh, And then you're also trying to age wine to make it more valuable. You might mix wine to make a rosé and all that type of stuff. It's a really cool game. Um, Super fun. Pretty easy to teach for uh, midweight euro. And I dig it. So my number 22 is Viticulture. Essential Edition is what we have. So that's what I'm going to put on here. Viticulture Essential Edition. I really like this game. I think I've already talked about it. um, And that I've had the really kind of odd situation with this game where... I had a friend of mine who is like really likes wine and goes on like tours of wineries and stuff um, with her friends and her family. And she was asking like, oh, well, is there a game about I was telling her, oh, yeah, there's games about wine and stuff. And she's like, no, really? I have to play that. And I said, well, it's kind of hard. Like the only game she played was Bob Ross. (laughs) Um, But she got it and she and her friends learned it and they loved it because they loved wine, the wine culture. And so I I like that the game is aesthetically pleasing. It's challenging, but it's also accessible. And I think the theme is, is really like nice. I also love the little bits, like the little table and the little, um, like arbor and the windmill or water thing. I I love all those little wooden pieces. Um, Speaking of little wooden pieces and really cute, my number 22, new game. This is like brand new, like hotness. Maybe not. I don't know. Yeah, I think it's from, I think it's from this year. Way to jump on the hype train. What? Shut up. What? Your next game? Come on. It's not hype. That was from last year. (laughs) It was hype last year though. Out the wazoo. (laughs) My number 22 is Santa Monica. Um, This is a game that is another one of those that it's obviously challenging and there's competition involved, but it also makes me feel super relaxed and chill because it's a game about building a boardwalk and a beach. And who doesn't love that? And the artwork is cute and, and like cartoon ish, but not like anime cartoon ish. Um, and you've got all these great, like little shaped meeples, little guys in, you know, board shorts and sunglasses, tourists and locals. And, um, you're trying to lay out your boardwalk and your beach in, in a way to maximize your points. 
by um, getting your sand dollars and getting what's the other thing you can get? It's just sand dollars, isn't it? Yeah, just sand dollars. Yeah. But you want to put your tourists and your locals and all in the right areas. Um, you want you're trying to move them around. You're drafting cards. Um, you want to get certain types of. Um, like locations and like shops next to each other. Like I, I just love this game. It's really fun. It's different every time. Um, you never know what's going to come out and it, it just, it just looks fun and it just, it's just a light. It's not super light cause you're making really key decisions, but it, it doesn't feel like taxing. So I'm number 22, Santa Monica. Yeah, this is a good, a good drafting game. Not yet. It's probably mid-weight for sure. I mean, you're not going to be like having AP over which tile you're going to take. And you don't have 800 rules that you have to do before you take a tile. You just take a tile and put it either on your beach or your boardwalk. Yeah, it's it's cool. I like it. And the color scheme is really great, too. It's just soothing. Yeah, it is. Uh, my number 21, I think Katie already talked about. Um, and I did. We are hitting Stonemeyer again. And I am going to make Tapestry my number 21. And this is everything Katie said. It's a civilization themed track moving game. <laughs> you're moving up you're moving up on tracks and you're getting different types of bonuses based on the track that you're on. You're trying to build these really cool landmarks on your little player board to cover up as many squares as you can to score points and get resources. Just a whole lot of stuff that is happening from moving one little cube over a space on a track. It's just it explodes with different actions based on what path you're taking in the game or what civilization you're using in the game. It's super fun. It's not actually hard to teach either because you say, hey, you either move up on a track, you take an income turn. That's your turn. And then, you know, after five income turns, your game is done. So, you know, use them wisely. Easy game to play, easy game to teach, but really fun. Enough decisions to make it interesting, and I like it quite a bit. So number 21, Tapestry. Yep, it's good. My number 21, um, Jason has already talked about because he ranked it too low. Um, I mean, too, too, yeah, too low on the list towards the number one. Um, but it is a dice drafting game, right? Or dice placement. It's dice drafting and placement, placement and deck building. Yeah. <laughs> and that is Taverns of Tiefenthal. Um, this game is so fun. There's so many things going on. There's lots of different choices, lots of different ways to win. Um, as you're kind of moving around, you can upgrade your tavern. Um, that's all I remember doing. You've got... <laughs> You can increase beer capacity. Yes, you can get yes. customers. That's all. Yeah. You're, yeah, you're just making your tavern better. Yeah. Getting customers. You're making your tavern better. Yeah, yeah. Getting customers in there. They're going to help give you points. Um, it's it's not ugly, but it definitely has an old school kind of art style to it. So it's kind of in between. But um, I, I think there's a, a good amount of weight to this. It's not overly mentally taxing in my opinion um but there are a lot of decisions to be made and when you're going to take them how you're going to make those um you know what you should take how you're going to utilize the dice um and there's there's some really neat dice mitigation that you can do as well so it's not all luck which i think is what makes this like a really good strategic game so number 21 taverns of tiefenthal yeah i think the ap goes down after you draft a few dice hmm. because you have less options yeah. based on, you know, the value of the dice. So it might have AP at the very beginning when all the dice are there. But after that, I mean, you're limited to what's out there. Well, it's because you want to do everything that you can. And yet it's like, okay, so which is the thing I want to do the most at the beginning? Right. Yeah. 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 All right. So that was our number 30 to 21. So let's give you a quick rundown of our list. All right, so my number 30 is Hadara. My number 29 is Newton. Newt, Newton. I, don't, I can't say that word. Love it, love it, love it. <laughs> my number 28 is Obsession. Rowad. <laughs> my number 27 is Terraforming Mars. My number 26 is Rococo. My number 25 is, I lost it, Vinos. My number 24 is Takinu. 23, Gugong. 22, Viticulture, and 21, Tapestry. 
My number 30 is Dice Forge. 29, Castles of Mad King Ludwig. 28, also Obsession. 27, Elysium. 26, Tapestry. 25, Orléans. 24, Terraforming Mars. 23, Concordia. 22, Santa Monica. And number 21, Taverns of Tiefenthal. All right. We have just two episodes left of our top 100. That's Yep. And maybe a Christmas episode in there. We'll see. Yeah, well, still, there's only there's gonna be two episodes of the top 100. That's true. I'm not saying yeah, the next two, but yeah, that's true. I can't believe it. Like, it just seems like we just started the 100. I know it goes real fast. It's it's nice. It's actually comforting because when you're trying to think of topics to put your podcast around, um, knowing that you know you're gonna have 10 episodes planned out is actually kind of nice. It is nice. Yep, uh, it is. Joel used to say <laughs> when you're uh, bankrupt for ideas. The top 100 is good. Uh, good to get the ball rolling. That's true. So, um, if you think w- once we get to the new year, we're going to be struggling a little bit um, <laughs> for for uh, podcast topics. So, if you can think of any episode topics, things you want to hear us ramble on about in just a pretty okay manner, tell us. Go to our Facebook page. Post there. If you aren't a member of our hashtag, the Riveted Facebook group, you need to join. That group is dope. Um, it is fire. Everyone is nice and friendly. No sus. It's good. I tried to put in all like the Gen Z <laughs> slang that I could think of, even though I don't think that that's our demographic on this podcast. It definitely is not. <laughs> so, yeah, everyone's great. Um, no politics, no trolling, no crankiness um just just games so yeah check that out um instagram twitter um youtube i'm trying to do to get involved in more videos we've got some really cool stuff we've got some unboxings um you know putting out more reviews got some really interesting games um coming your way so definitely like subscribe comment on those on those youtube videos we love to hear what content's working for you what's not um we just we just love to hear from the riveted because you guys are amazing yeah back to our demo i think our demo is too old for that considering we were having discussions about gray hair (laughs) that that's true (laughs) shoot (laughs) yeah yes the riveted is, is awesome they you are the best and we love interacting with you and it makes it fun yeah, everyone's young at heart here. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> That's the only way we're young here. That's true. Oh my gosh. <laughs> That's the reason why I'm like, man, I'm get it's get, I'm getting tired. We got to wrap this up. I'm too old to be staying up late. Oh, I have no more banter. Yeah, me neither. All right. Well, I've been Katie, and I'm Jason. Keep gaming, everybody. Keep gaming. <laughs> <laughs>